take your Bibles. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, someone asked me, said, well, uh, is there any way we can get our hands on some of those messages you preach at church camp? We don't record those. Uh, there's a reason for that. No, we don't want any, uh, we want some uh, deniability, you know. We want to be able to walk away from that and not be blamed for anything. But tonight, I want to give you at least a portion of what we looked at while we were at church camp. And we're going to talk about the battle for your mind. Now, life is full of battles, isn't it? And uh, some of our battles are silly. You know, uh, I heard about a man, I know you've heard this, this story before, but a man that uh, decided he was going to go on a diet. And uh, he was headed to work one morning. He was really battling with his diet, trying to stay on it, trying to be good about it. He drove past a donut shop, and he thought to himself, as every good red-blooded American would think, uh, he thought how great it would be to have a warm donut and a nice black cup of coffee. But he said to himself, I, only, I will only stop and get my donut and coffee if there is a parking spot on the front row of this coffee shop. And sure enough, after seven trips around the block, there was a spot right up front. Now, all of us, uh, we all face the battle of the bulge, right? We all had that battle. We all struggle with that. But there is a much more serious battle that I think many people don't even realize that we're engaged in, and that is the battle for your mind. Now, those of us who are being awakened to some things are starting to realize that Satan has waged war against us. He's waged war against this world, and mostly the battleground is the mind of people, and the prize is their soul. He wants to, he wants to wage this battle, and he can do it when he, when he gets a hold of your mind, and he does it through many tactics. We'll get into some of that, but if you would... Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's read in verse 3. And Paul is telling us something here. Uh, if anybody, if any place knew about the corruption of the mind and the morals, it would have been the Corinthian church. They certainly understood. And here's what Paul says to them. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, uh, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you see it right there, don't you? I, immediately, immediately he lets us know that we are in a battle. When you look in all these words here uh, in this text, you're going to see that there is a battle raging. And every Christian ought to know this by now if you don't know it. Uh, you need to be in the know that life is not a playground, it's a battleground. And there's a battle for your mind. So let's talk about this tonight. Three things I want to lay on your heart and on your mind from this passage of Scripture. Number one, think about the warfare of our foe. When you look at a verse of Scripture, if you're going to read the Bible and understand what the Bible is saying to you, one of the things, one of the keys to understanding the Bible is looking for repeated words and repeated themes. Uh, so when you're looking in this text, immediately you see things like war. He said, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Immediately, immediately Paul begins to express to us that there is a battle going on. He talks about uh, the weapons and the warfare that we're facing. So he's letting us know that there's a conflict that's happening. But where is it happening? Well, you look at repeated words, repeated themes. He says in our text, he says, uh, we're, not, we're not warring after the flesh. But he goes on to say in verse 4, he says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Do you see the repeated themes? War, warfare, weapons. Thoughts, imaginations, knowledge. There is a war going on, and the war is for your mind. And Satan is, he is brutalizing people through this battlefront, uh, destroying the minds of young people. Now, I want to I speak a few minutes about the warfare of our foe. Notice that this warfare is a spiritual battle. There is without a doubt a massive 
offensive being waged against us today. The battleground is your mind. The prize is your soul. And, and Satan wants to conquer. He wants to contaminate. And he wants to control your mind that he might set it up as a place to war against God. Because he knows that if he gets your mind, he's going to have you where he wants you. He can control you as long as he's controlling your thought life. Your thought life is going to be so very important. That's why the Bible tells us to guard our hearts because out of it are the issues of life. That heart is talking about your mind, where decisions are made, the, the part of your brain where you're thinking as God would have you to think. We know that this battle is spiritual and we have other places of reference. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 with me, an old too familiar verse. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse 11. Paul says, There he said, But put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles are the systematic schemes that he is waging against you, the, his plan. Satan doesn't do all of this willy-nilly. He, he has a plan, he has a scheme to break down your guard and to break into your mind and to control you and contaminate you through your mind. He said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness, spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a spiritual battle. I mean, we're, we're talking about a, a time in our government where, where they're saying, well, yes, we're, we're fighting an invisible enemy. Listen, we've always been fighting an invisible enemy. When he says we're talking about principalities, the rulers of the darkness of this world, he's talking about demonic forces that are in, a, in and around us all of the time. It's something that we've always faced. Satan has always been attacking the mind, attacking your pride, attacking your flesh, attacking your heart so that he might can uh, control you and contaminate you and set up and wage war against God. Now, this is not a physical fight. It's a, it's a spiritual fight. He wants to get your thought life. And when he destroys the thought life of someone, he can destroy the physical life. And without a shadow of a doubt, he will destroy your spiritual life. Your spiritual life will be brought down all through your thought life if we don't guard our hearts and our minds. Now, I want you to understand something that uh, the average uh, psychiatrist today would not agree with, that there is a difference between your mind and your brain. Let me explain that to you. Uh, your brain is the instrument that's used for thought. Your mind is what you think with. Your brain is the instrument by which you think. Uh, it's just like uh, the difference in pianos. The piano uh, expresses the music that the pianist plays. Now, some of us have better pianos than other people. Amen? Uh, some of us have baby grands, and some of us have pianos like what was in the back hallway that we gave to the church camp. All right? Some of us have better Pianos, better instruments than somebody else. But you have in your head, you have as a born-again Christian, you ought to have the mind of Christ. And, and just because you have the mind of Christ doesn't mean you have a higher IQ. I can have the mind of Christ. I can see things the way that God sees them. I can think spiritual thoughts, but that doesn't mean I can do math higher than a fifth grade level. I don't, my IQ doesn't go up because I have the mind of Christ. It means that I have a different perspective on life. As I have the mind of Christ, he begins to change the paradigm of how I see. And this spiritual demonic realm is waging war for you through your mind. It's a spiritual battle. Secondly is this. It's a personal battle. This is not somebody else's fight. It's your fight. It's your battle. It's your problem. And understand that it's something that everybody is going to have to face. And just because you're saved, and just because you've been saved a long time, doesn't mean that you're not going to face this battle. Uh, you're, you're wise to guard your mind even at an older age. When you think that maybe you've outgrown some things and maybe you've come too far. Listen, uh, this battle is personal. It's coming to you. And just because you got saved doesn't mean it's not going to happen. In fact... That's when the battle really begins. Satan's going to have to wage war against you, and he, is, he has done it, and he is attacking many people, and he is successfully destroying people through many venues today. Would you agree with me that it is much easier 
to attack the mind of people today than it has ever been. Would you agree with that statement? Just nod your head. Let me know you're still breathing. Yeah, okay. And why is that? Because we've taken some advances, haven't we, in, in our technology. The way that uh, how easy it is to communicate, how easy it is to see things and learn things and, and how connected we are as a society, yet we've never been honest, so let's be honest, we've never been more connected than we are today, but we've really never been more disconnected than what we are today. We've never had more friendships than we have today, but we really have never had shallower friendships than what we have today. You know, I mean, before I uh, repented of my sins and, and control alt deleted my Facebook, uh, I had 700 and some friends in this lonesome world, of whom half I couldn't even name. Had all these virtual friends. We're, we're living in a day and age where it's easier than ever for Satan to wage battle against your mind. I, I want to read some statistics to you. SBS News reports that teens spend roughly 1,200 hours a year on social media. And all the adults said, amen, finger wagging. But don't go just yet. I read other reports that say the average adult spends nearly 1,000 hours a year on social media as well. Listen, adults are just as guilty as teenagers are. That we are tuned into these things. And listen, these things are being used to program and reprogram our minds and the way that we think. World, or U.S. News and World Report reports that teenagers listen to 10,500 hours of secular music between the grades of 7 and 12. You say, well, is that a lot? Well, that's only 500 hours less than they will spend in school their entire life. Now, I have had people stand in this church building and argue with me that the things that go into your mind and into your eyes and into your ears do not affect you. And to that I say you're only lying to yourself. You think that stuff doesn't affect you? Now, I'm not saying if you play a video game that's violent that it's, you're going to become a serial killer. I'm not saying that. Many people who play video games didn't become serial killers. But I am saying this. Can a man take fire into his bosom and be not burned? I don't think so. You cannot take these things into your life. Here's what many experts are saying. It says many experts are linking the growing drug addiction and suicide rates to fatalistic music and mind-corrupting content that people are consuming. The narcotic, sexual, fatalistic nature of mainstream media is corrupting our minds and killing our children. Duh! Duh! You can't tell me that it took some genius, some... It says many experts. It doesn't take an expert to figure out these things affect your mind. The Bible says this, it says in Proverbs 23, 7, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And your mind, how your mind operates determines who you are and how you are. It's going to determine how you go. And you say, well, uh, can the Bible bear that out? Romans 8, 6 says, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It's just that simple. There is a battle. The warfare of our foe. The second thought I wanted to give you before I send you off to Brahms is this. The weakness of our flesh. He says in our text, oh, i got to go back over there. He says, uh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. He said in the beginning of this, he said, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. This battle that we're battling here is a battle that we don't fight with flesh and blood. Why? Because we're not battling against flesh and blood. I mean, there's some carnality involved in all of this, but the battle really begins in your mind. It begins up here in in the part of your brain and, and in your heart, the seat of your emotions, where you begin to think like God thinks. And our flesh is weak. Have you ever heard the expression that my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak? We cannot battle these things in our flesh. In Ephesians chapter 6, I read a few verses to you a moment ago from chapter 6. But uh, if you back up one verse to chapter 10, Paul started all of that by saying this. He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
over in our text, he says, For our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It's the Lord's strength that is to help us through all of this. You say, well, how do I be strong in the Lord? How do I be strong in the power of His might? Well, he says there in our text to be strong. But then he says to put on the whole armor of God. Guard yourself. Guard your mind. Guard your heart. Guard every part of you as if, as if Satan is attacking you every day because he is. As if he's knocking on your door because he is. And, he's, and we're just opening the door and inviting him in. And it's irritating because everybody is susceptible to these things. Paul says put on the whole armor of God. And the very first piece of armor he talks about is the belt of truth. Now we're living in a day and age of lies. But let that word just wash over you for a moment that Jesus wants us to put on, the Lord wants us to put on the belt of truth. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, Jesus is truth. You spend time in the truth. This is the written word. This is the truth of God that he gives us. And then you allow the spirit of God to speak to you and he will lead you into all truth. I, I want to I contend this, that the, I think the reason that many of us lose the battle of our mind is because we don't, we don't cater to our spirit nearly as often as we cater to our flesh. And though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We need to put on the, the whole armor of God and let the truth uh, of God roll over you. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 30, verse 32. Write those verses down. It says, if we continue, he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Now, I want to say this. I read those statistics, and I'm not talking to teenagers. I'm talking to all of us. I'm talking to all people everywhere. I read those statistics that we're spending 1,000, 1,200 hours a year on social media. I wonder, I wonder if the same could be said for how much time we spend in the Word. And I wonder if the battle might not have a different outcome if we spend as many hours in the Word as we spend on social media or in uh, mainstream media of any kind. Our minds are being compromised. You say, well, how, why is this so vitally important? Now, let me share a couple of thoughts with you about that. First of all, because God communicates to you through your mind. Go over to Ephesians chapter 4 with me, would you? Ephesians chapter 4. I almost never make you all turn in your Bibles. It's good practice for you. Ephesians chapter 4, and look at verse 17. Some people say, well, I just wish I knew what God wanted for me. Well, here's, here's, a, here's a hint for you how you can know. God is going to communicate with you. He's going to do it through your mind. That's why Satan is trying to set up a stronghold there. That's why he's trying to put his foot in the door and establish a fortress there in your mind because your mind is where God wants to communicate with you. And if Satan can set up corruption there, and contamination there, then he can silence the voice of the Spirit in your heart and in your mind. Look at verse 17. He said, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And that word heart there is the same word as mind. Their mind has been blinded. And God wants to, he wants to open that up so he can speak to you because he's going to speak to you through your mind. Satan wants to darken your mind. He, he's waging war against your mind so that he might darken it so the truth of God can't come in. So the gospel of God can't come in. So the conviction of God can't come in. So the knowledge of God can't come in. He wants to darken your mind and have you walk in your flesh. And I've told you a hundred times right here from this piece of carpet that God, uh, that Satan doesn't have to get you to sin. All he's got to do is get us to walk in our flesh. And if we're walking in our flesh, you cannot, you cannot walk in your flesh and walk in the spirit at the same time. It can't be done. And so all he wants to do is darken and, and dull your mind up so that you are walking in your flesh. And then God's communication to your mind is not coming in. Now, I know that people love, uh, not necessarily here in our church, but in, in evangelical America, 
We love the emotional aspect of worship. Uh, we love to get stirred up and fired up, and I, I get a little stirred up and fired up, and I, I think we ought to be stirred up and fired up. I think we ought to be a little emotional. But I want to say this. I want to say the emotions, God is not going to speak to you through your emotions. Your emotions are the shallowest part of your being, and salvation is the deepest work of God in your life. When he begins to work in your heart and in your mind, he's going to speak to your mind more than he speaks to your emotions. I remember the first time that I led someone to Christ and they were pretty much emotionless. It bothered me deeply. And I'm looking at this kid. We were at church camp, been several years ago, and he's, he's just come, he comes down the aisle. He looks concerned, but there's really no emotions. And we, we go through it all, and he, he prays, and he asks God to forgive him of his sins, and he accepts Christ as his Savior. But, you know, I was used to boo-hooing and ball-hauling and rejoicing and jumping and kicking and shouting and screaming, and, and it, this kid was just being himself. And it bothered me, and I'm looking at him like, well, maybe you didn't get it. Maybe you just didn't get it. You know, but the more I talk to him, the more I realize he does really get it. He probably gets it more than some who are overly emotional. But God is not speaking to him through his emotions. God was speaking to him through his mind. And in his mind, he said, you know what? What's being said is true. I am a sinner. I have sinned against God. And, and God sent his son to the cross to die for me. He understood that in his mind. And I was concerned about his emotions. But God, God doesn't speak to us through our emotions. Your marriage isn't based on your emotions, is it? I sure hope not. If my marriage was based on emotions... Uh, then you wouldn't want to believe the suicide note that I leave, okay? Because Kara, uh, our emotions go up and down. Well, Kara's are pretty much right here. You can't really tell what she's thinking, but mine go up and down and in and out. And if I was married or unmarried based on emotions, well, I wouldn't be married very long. And when God is working in your life, he's not working through your emotions. Now, I'm not saying you won't be emotional, but he works through your mind. He communicates to your mind. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your emotions, of your mind. The renewing of your mind. Satan wants to darken that mind so that he might have his way in that. It amazes me. It amazes me. Have you ever, you know, you, you can say, Well, Brother Range, is that really true, true? Is Satan really trying to darken our minds? Uh, so that he can do whatever he wants, corrupt us, contaminate us, control us? The answer is yes. Uh, a thousand times yes. And I can prove it to you because if you've ever witnessed anybody, if you've ever each one tried to reach one, you're going to find yourself at times witnessing to people and they don't get it. I mean, it hits them and it just falls off of them. And you think... Uh, why, why don't they understand what I'm saying? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, because the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Uh, another reason would be because uh, they're dead. They're spiritually dead. You ever have a conversation with the corpse? It's kind of hard, isn't it? Uh, but one of the reasons why when you're witnessing to somebody and you're giving them your best shot, I mean, you got the Roman road written on the back of your hand, and, you're, and you've prayed up, and you've and you stayed up, and you've worried about them, and you're ready, and you're presenting the gospel to them, and you're showing them that we're all sinners, we're all lost, we all need the gospel, and they still just don't get it. And you say, why? Why don't they get it? Why does it bounce off of them? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 says this, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Remember that. You're talking to dead people who are lost, spiritually dead. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Why? Lest, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Did you catch the first part of all that? He says, we, if our gospel is hidden, it's, it's hidden to those who are lost, who've had their minds 
blinded by the God of this world. That's the God that he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 when he says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, demonic forces, spiritual wickedness. He's blinding minds. That's why it's important to guard your mind because God's going to communicate to you through your mind. That's why it's important that we open our Bibles and study them and read them because that's where God begins to communicate. And then also God changes you by changing your mind. He changes you by changing your mind. How many people have had their mind changed about church? <laughs> I've met some people uh, who've had their mind changed about church, about Jesus, about Christians, about preachers. There's been a lot of people. Who, uh, who saw the preacher coming. Yeah, that's the worst preacher I've ever heard. Can't stand him. Always contradicting himself. Always talking too loud. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But when their heart gets changed, when God speaks to their, their heart through their mind, and their heart gets changed, guess what? He might become the sweetest, best preacher they ever heard. I've had people say, listen, I understand you're trying to get me to come down there, but listen, I'm just not a what? A church person, right? Well, guess what? There was a time when I wasn't much of a church person either. But when God changed my mind, he changed my heart. He changed my desires. He changes us by changing our mind. I became a church person. The preacher who could not get to my front door, who I would not, when I saw him coming, I'd shut the blinds when God touched my heart. Some of you are laughing because you probably done. <laughs> you know, Y'all don't do that to me and Brother West, do you? When we show up, oh, here they come. Oh. We can see y'all peeking through the blinds. We know who you are. That's why we do ambushes. We sneak up on people. The preacher who I used to hide from, when God spoke to my heart and to my mind and changed me by changing my mind, couldn't get me away from his table at night. He'd say, Brother Matt, listen, I'm glad you're excited. But it's 2 a.m. Go home. God changes you. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us, put off the old man, put on the new man. How are we to do that? He tells us in verse 23, by renewing the spirit of your, say it with me, mind. Your mind. That's why there's a battle for your mind. Because it's where God changes you. It's where Satan corrupts you. The idea behind verse 23 is that God is constantly changing us, bringing us more and more and more in line with God's point of view. That's what he's doing. Through your mind, not your emotions. Number three is this, and I'll close with this thought. The weapons of our fight. Verse 4. I've got to go back where I was. He said, the weapon of our warfare, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So we're going to need some weapons since we're in a battle, but this is a spiritual fight that requires spiritual battle. Paul is declaring war against the spiritually evil forces of the Roman Empire that have corrupted Corinth. He talks about pulling down strongholds. What's a stronghold? It's a fortress. It's where uh, he's talking about where Satan has set up fortresses and strongholds in, in the Corinthians and in their culture. He talks about casting down imaginations. He's talking about destroying false arguments. You think we're up against false arguments today in our society in America? There's false arguments everywhere. He talks about these strongholds. He talks about the corruption of the mind, how he wants to corrupt the world's mind, darken their understanding, harden their hearts, and create a stronghold of arrogance and ignorance. And I want to tell you something. Satan is succeeding in America of creating a stronghold of arrogance and ignorance in America today. The average American is arrogant and the average American is ignorant. That's why, that's why Paul says that we need spiritual strength from Christ to pull down those strongholds. Casting down imaginations, those false arguments. And then reaching out and bringing into captivity every thought, putting it under Christ. We need weapons. We're in a war. Here's a couple of weapons to take with you. Very simple. 
This is preaching 101. Number one is this. One of the weapons that we need is the presence of God. Without the presence of Almighty God in our lives, we are helpless children. And we can no more fight this battle, this spiritual battle for the mind, than we can get hit by a train and walk away and live. We just can't. You better have the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Step one, if you've never done it, is to repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ and his shed blood on Calvary for your salvation. My friend, if you are living without God, if you've not invited the Holy Spirit into your life and have his presence inside of you, you are in danger of being a great casualty of this massive offensive, this battle being waged against you. But when you trust Jesus, the moment that you repent of your sin and you trust in him as your Lord and Savior, the God himself and the person of the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you and you have something that the world does not have. You have the presence of God in your life. And what shall we say then about these things? If God be for us, what? Who can be against us? You are of God, little children. You have overcome them because greater is he that is in you that is in, than is in the world. You have the presence of God, and with the presence of God comes the power of God in your life. Many people are struggling, and, and they're fading uh, to the side, and they're being corrupted and torn down and cast into a lake of fire because they don't have the power of God in their life. And many Christians are succumbing to the powers of this dark world because they're not exercising the power of God in their life. Paul told us in Ephesians 6.10 to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. The presence of God in your life can bring the power of God in your life. If I were to ask any child in here how what David used to bring down Goliath without hesitation, the children of this church would say that David took a sling and five smooth stones and that is how he took down Goliath. Some would even dare to to uh, be technical and say well, that's not how he killed him. He took him down with that sling and those smooth stones, but he took his own sword and he sawed off Goliath's head right where he lay. That's how he killed him, Brother Matt. But I'll tell you this, the power that David went out with, listen, he went out with the power of God. He could have gone out with a, a McDonald's straw and a handful of paper wads and he was going to win that fight. Because he had somebody on his side that Goliath didn't know about. Goliath was laughing and mocking at him when he came out. He said, am I a dog? Am I a dog that you have sent me out, this young boy, to battle against me? David saunters out there and with great confidence because I, he said, you come after me with swords and spears, but I come unto you in the name of the God of Israel whose armies you defy, and he will smite you. He will deliver you into my hand. I will smite thee. Because of the power of God in my life. No giant can stand when you have the presence of God in your life and you have the power of God in your life. Not a giant can stand in front of you. You can't take him down. That you can't cast down imaginations. And you can't bring into captivity every thought and put it under Christ. David saunters out there. You see, the fight was fixed. It wasn't even fair. Poor old Goliath never had a chance. Never had a chance. David walked out there with great confidence because he knew something that Goliath didn't know. He had the power of God in his life. One other weapon you ought to take with you. And if you're sitting here on a Sunday night at 6, 652, you already know this. That's the people of God. That's a weapon on your side. I want to close by saying this, and we'll, we'll prepare for an invitation. Don't underestimate the importance of your church family. You need them. And they need you. Uh, we've come into a place, and I, and I want to say this with, with all sincerity from my heart. We've come into a place where Christians are going to face battles. Listen, nobody, nobody is immune to spiritual battles. Nobody is immune to the struggles of life. And that goes from the top down to the bottom, to the children and in and, and the in the, in the chapel, in the back, all the way to the pastors and the leaders of our organizations. There are battles. But we've come to a place now where it, it's almost become taboo to talk about any struggle you might have. And, and people are looking for help. There are people right here struggling and hurting. But, but we've come to a place where we're afraid 
We're afraid to let down our guard and say, I need help. I struggle. I have, I have had faults and failures in my life. And people are turning to other avenues for help because they are too afraid to pitch it out in front of the people of God and trust them with the truth that we're all broken. We're all sinners. Brother Adam told a story this week at church camp about a Christian who was finding himself at a gay and lesbian uh, organization meeting. And he said he was there. He said they just showed up to begin to talk about these things and to, and to just reason with them from the scriptures about their lifestyle and different things. And he said, I'm glad that you're here because I'm a Christian. I'm actually a part of this Baptist community over here, this ministry. But I struggle with these things in my mind and in my heart about homosexuality and my orientation. He said, but I know, here's what he said, I know that I cannot present my struggle to the believers in my group. That's a shame. Because the one place, the one place he's looking, he's looking to a secular gay and lesbian organization to help give him answers about his issue. And he feels like he can't take it to his brothers and sisters in Christ. That's insanity. Because he knows that only, only judgment will be cast. That only condemnation will be cast. One of the great weapons in our warfare are the people of God, should be. The people of God. That I've got your back. And you've got my back. And I realize that you have struggles and you have battles and I have battles and struggles. And, and that we're in this together that I ought to be able to lean on you and come to you. And you ought to be able to come to me. I don't know what your battle is today, but I want you to know that there is, there is rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to have our musicians come. We're going to prepare to close. Do you want to win the battle for your mind today? Do you want to learn how to overcome some things? Well, listen, use the weapons you've been given. First, come and know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Know the person of God, the presence of God. Gain the power of God in your life, and then lean on the people of God that he places in your life. You say, well, Brother Reigns, you don't understand, man. The, the Satan is just, he's attacking me left and right. Well, the Apostle Paul gave us some good words in Philippians 4. He said, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Do you know God has wired your mind to where you can't think, think two thoughts at the same time? You can't. And if you're thinking about the things of God, you're dwelling on good things, then Satan has no room to come in and, and to corrupt your mind. Put the Word of God in your life. One of the great weapons of our spiritual warfare so often is this sword right here. So often it is sheathed on our coffee tables. So often it is sheathed up onto the shelves of our homes. So often it is not unsheathed until Sunday or much later when we finally open it and blow the dust off of it and look, look at it for the first time in a week. And then we wonder why we lose the battle. One of the ways to win this battle is to surrender. But not to the enemy, but to the Lord Jesus Christ.